The biggest movie opening of all time was the last Harry Potter movie. There was huge anticipation for it, and it made $90 million in its first day. But did you know that Grand Theft Auto V, a video game, recently made about 10 times that much, 800 million in its first day? Video games are probably bigger business than you realize. Between one and two billion people play them worldwide, and they play for a combined three billion hours every week. And we can now safely forget the stereotypes that they're just played by quirky adolescent boys. In the United States, for example, the average player is now 31 years old, and 48% of players are female. So even though they've only been around for about 40 years, video games have already become an extraordinary force in modern society. And they can deeply impact behavior, for good or for bad. Now, you've probably heard more of the bad. For example, some research does support links between playing violent video games and real-life outcomes, such as aggression and desensitization to violence. In a high-profile illustration of this, a 17-year-old recently shot both of his parents in the head when they tried to take away his copy of Halo 3, the game you see here. Another infamous example is that the Columbine, Colorado shooters had customized a version of their favorite video game, Doom, in order to plan and then practice their 1999 massacre. Now, these are extreme examples, and it is important to emphasize that the vast majority of people who play games like these do not commit antisocial acts. However, the most recent review endorsed by the American Psychological Association does support overall links like these. Another negative issue we need to think about is that of video game addiction. You generally don't see news about somebody watching a movie over and over again until he dies. But this is the type of thing we are seeing more frequently with regard to video games. In a related incident, a young couple recently became obsessed with this video game in which they raised a virtual child online. They played for so many hours and became so infatuated that they apparently forgot that they had a real three-month-old at home who ended up dying from starvation and neglect. This does not sound like the behavior of people who are just playing games. However, this tremendous power can also be leveraged to improve health. For example, <clears throat> active video games like Dance Dance Revolution can help encourage exercise, which is, of course, associated with many positive health outcomes. And adventure games like Bronchi the Bronchiosaurus can help kids with asthma learn more about their condition and how to control it. And video games are particularly good with rehabilitation, for example, from a fracture or a stroke. This is because they can take a therapy that could have been very monotonous and make it much more engaging. Finally, we've had success using video games to distract from pain or anxiety. For example, this virtual reality game leads burn victims through a refreshing snow world while they're having their bandages changed, which can be very painful. These games are a great start. However, I think we're just scratching the surface in terms of truly harnessing the power of this medium to improve health. This is because health behaviors like tobacco and alcohol use and diet and exercise patterns are still the biggest underlying causes of death and disease. But we've just seen that the video game industry is really good at getting people to perform certain tasks and to stick with them for the long haul. So, I'll now highlight four basic principles they use that I think we can learn from. The first deals with instant reward. In health and medicine, we're all about the long-term payoff. We say things to patients like, Mr. Smith, if you take your blood pressure medicine every day for the rest of your life, then you might have less illness. But of course, you won't necessarily feel any different when you take it or when you don't. No wonder adherence to this kind of therapy 
is about 50%. It is not this way with video games, which are riddled with continuous positive reinforcement. This is Peggle, an example of a casual puzzle game, sort of in the Angry Birds genre. At any given moment, there will be an adorable beaver popping out and saying, excellent, inside a spiky speech bubble. You can see that because you hit a particular target, you get 50,000 bonus points, not five or 10. And every time you complete a level, which only takes a minute or two, your victory is celebrated by a dramatic full orchestral version of Beethoven's Ode to Joy. <laughs> How can we emulate this with our blood pressure patient? I can't make fireworks appear above his head at the exact moment he takes his pill every day. Now, we do have the technology to add 10 points to his online total whenever the pill bottle opens, and I suppose I could program it to play a little song, but is this going to be truly motivating or more irritating? Related to this, imagine that familiar scenario where you are faced with that rich chocolate cake at the end of a meal. You want to resist, but there is that lure of immediate reward immediate dopamine, the pleasure chemical rushing into your brain. But what is the reward of holding back? Some theoretical future benefit? This leads to the second strategy I think we should take from the video game industry, that of truly leveraging a social network. Maybe I can't produce a spontaneous cheer at the exact moment you decide to forego the chocolate cake. But maybe you press a button reporting that success, and soon, positive feedback begins to appear from a network of others. And then, some of that same dopamine washes over you. It may not be as immediate or as intense, but it is a start. Now, some things like this do exist. For example, when you go for a run, you can program an app on your phone or an accelerometer on your wrist to automatically transmit all of your jogging stats to your friends. But I think there is room to move here. How can we make these things even more fun, engaging, and rewarding? For example, video game makers work wonders with social networks. This is World of Warcraft, which has 8 million subscribers. That's more subscribers than People Magazine and Sports Illustrated combined. These worlds are extremely engaging, and they become very real to their participants. For example, this couple recently bonded so much over Minecraft, another online adventure game, that they made it their wedding theme. I think we in health can better harness the power of social networking. Third, we need to acknowledge that talent and expertise count. You don't just come up with Pac-Man or SimCity overnight. It requires exactly the right nuanced combination of graphics, of storytelling, and psychology. So, we need to identify the genius designers of the future and get them to apply creatively the principles of game design to our biggest problems in public health. Of course, talent is expensive, and this will require initial investments if we're going to do this right. However, if we can get people to spend just some of the time and attention on their health that they currently spend on games like these, the ultimate reward will be massive. Fourth and finally, we need to learn from successful video games the importance of having achievable intermediate milestones. Every great video game is progressive. It's based on levels to conquer and tasks to achieve. You can feel good about each progressive step. Now, it's partially this progressive nature that probably leads to some of the addictive properties we saw earlier. Those people who were playing 50 hours of video games in a row were not simply doing the same thing again and again. They were continually progressing, getting to the next level, and they were so compelled that they couldn't stop. But we in healthcare still structure too much as pass or fail. Either you made your cholesterol goal or you didn't. And then, you don't have a chance to show improvement until your next visit a year from now. 
Successful video games, on the other hand, have organic and well-structured relationships between whatever the current challenge is and the overall big picture. So, stealing the smarts of video games will not be as simple as just gamifying. It would be nice to think that we can just take our current health-related treatments and stick on a game-like component, like points, incentives, or graphics. But that will not be enough. Because what we've seen today is that certain games are successful because of a synergistic combination of many different elements. So, there is huge potential here. But in order to truly realize this potential, we're going to have to carefully apply principles like the four that I've outlined today. In other words, we're going to need to get much more serious about games. And in the spirit of that, just for listening to my talk today, I hereby award each of you 20,000 bonus points. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.